This is Science Friday. I'm John Dankosky. If you've ever had surgery, you've probably wondered about how anesthesia works, or maybe even lied awake at night anxious about going under. I know I have. Now, if you've ever been there, I'm sure you remember what it's like. It's right before surgery. You get rolled into an operating room. The anesthesiologist tells you to start counting down from 10. And the next thing you know, you're awake in the recovery room. You don't even remember anything that just happened to you. How exactly did the anesthesiologist manage to get you safely into that state and, and back out again? So joining me now to give us a crash course in anesthesia and answer some of your questions are my guests, Dr. Louise Sun, a professor of anesthesiology, perioperative and pain medicine at Stanford University Health, based in Stanford, California, and Dr. Ganesha Kaur, an anesthesiologist and director of the Human Rights Impact Lab and medical director of Weill Cornell Center for Human Rights at Weill Cornell Medicine, based in New York, New York. Dr. Sun, Dr. Kaur, welcome to Science Friday. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And this program is being taped on Zoom in advance, so we're going to hear a lot of questions from our audience here. Dr. Kaur, I, I want to start with you. And, you know, we typically think about it when we talk about anesthesia, we talk about going to sleep. So what's the difference between going to sleep and going under anesthesia? It's a great question and one that we receive a lot from our patients. There are some critical differences between receiving anesthesia and going to sleep. When you go to sleep, you have the ability to form memories, to wake up, to feel pain. If, for example, while you're sleeping, your dog scratches your leg or your cat scratches your leg or, or a child wakes you up, um, you will remember that. You can remember that. You can wake yourself up. You might remember that you feel thirsty or you have to go to the bathroom and you'll wake yourself up and you'll do those things and you'll fall back to sleep. Under anesthesia, you don't form memories in the same way. You don't remember things in that same way. Um, and you shouldn't feel pain in that same way. So there are critical differences between sleep and anesthesia. Okay, so why is that? Why don't I feel pain? Why don't I remember things? What are you giving me exactly? Well, anesthesia isn't like a pill that's given or a, a machine that's turned on and off. Um, there are several different anesthetics that are, are given um, that are carefully titrated to a person's individual needs. During a procedure, we monitor and sometimes control a person's breathing or their heart rate or rhythm, looking at an EKG, their blood pressure, their blood oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, we monitor by pulse oximeter. Um, we, we look at concentrations of anesthetic gases in the body, fluid levels in the body, temperature, and sometimes brain activity even. So those are, we give several different medications that affect each of those things. Medications for your heart are different than medications that put you to sleep are different than medications that control pain. So it's a combination of medications that really helps provide all of the things that you need to be under anesthesia. So, so Dr. Sun, then what exactly do you do when you're making this, this mix? How do you decide how much of this agent and how much of this are we going to use to get this person into exactly the state that we need them to arrive at? Yeah, John, that's a great question. And that's what we term balanced anesthesia. And so what that means is that the cocktail could differ slightly from person to person, and we do want to tailor what we give according to the person's age, that person's physiology, um, you know, pain or stimulation level that we anticipate with the type of surgery that they're going to undergo, as well as, you know, a set of um, phys physiologic and hemodynamic goals that we have for that particular patient undergoing that particular surgery uh, under a very specific set of circumstances. So we tailor all those things uh, to achieve what we call amnesia. So in other words, they don't have a memory or recall the event. Analgesia, which is uh, achieving a painless state uh, so that they're comfortable uh, undergoing surgery without overdoing it with the drug dosages. And also that uh, you know, they're, they're basically immobile for the surgery. Um, so, so those are uh, basically the considerations. And, and the doses, as you say, would be different depending on your age, but they could also vary depending on, say, if you, if you take drugs, if you smoke, if you are on some sort of drug regimen for some other health issue, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, people, for instance, who drink alcohol or people who, um, you know, are on, um, say, a cannabis or an opioid medication chronically will have a different tolerance level or threshold uh, for the medications that we give. There are drug to drug interactions to consider as well, right? So, you know, there, there's some interactions that can be deemed to be synergistic, meaning we have to reduce the dosages of certain medications we give uh, versus there are medications that really don't interact well and could produce some very dangerous side effects that we have to watch out for. So, so it's so really about pharmacology as well. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm sorry for for interrupting. I'll, I'll just say that I I think that we've all had the experience of a doctor during a a regular physical exam asking a question about how much we drink over the week, and we think, should I tell my doctor how much I drink over the week? But this is this is an example, uh, Doctor Core, that really you should you should tell people, okay, here's here's other medications I'm on. Here's some things you need to know about me because it's going to be harder for you to do your job if I don't. That's exactly right. So like Louise said, the type of anesthesia you receive, how much anesthesia you receive depends on your body weight, your age, the type of surgical procedure, but it also depends on individual things like your genetics or medications, whether they're prescription or recreational that you take. And I think there is sometimes a fear of telling your doctor the truth. We all want to present our best selves to our doctors. Um, but I think it's it's really critical that your physician knows what medications you've been taking. It's not a problem if, let's say, you are a smoker, that your surgery is necessarily going to be canceled. It's not necessarily a problem if you use marijuana recreationally, but those are things that we need to know so that we can provide you the best care. And then, of course, Dr. Sun, there are there are different surgeries that are very different. For instance, uh, many people know that that during brain surgery, there's a portion of the procedure that you are out for, but there's another portion of, the, of certain procedures where the physician, the surgeon, will want you to be awake during what's happening. Exactly. And so, you know, that's what we call surgical considerations for the type of anesthesia that we give. And so, you know, for uh, those procedures you're referring to in the realm of neurosurgery are called awake craniotomies. So, you know, those are surgeries where we're, we're going around the very sensitive uh, motor and speech areas, for instance, where we really want to have a real-time testing of, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your brain function during the time that uh, they, they work uh, in that delicate area, you know, there. Uh, so in that case, the anesthesiologist will need to blend their co cocktails carefully so that they're relieving the patient's anxiety um, and the medication will be short acting enough so that, you know, they could be deep asleep when they need to and they can wake up when they need to um, and so on. Uh, so another more common procedure that, that many people undergo that's preventative is a colonoscopy. And there's a variety of different uh, levels of sedation you can undergo. I, I guess I'm wondering, Dr. Sun, do you have patients who say, I, I only want to be this far under for my colonoscopy, or I don't want to have anything really that relieves anything but a little bit of pain? Yeah, we do get a version of that. Um, you know, my primary uh, specialty is cardiac anesthesia. So, you know, that's what we do most of the time. But we do get requests from patients to, um, say, be solidly asleep for a relatively small procedure because they're quite anxious about it versus patients who actually want to be awake and watch the whole thing, which at times may not be very feasible. So you do get a full spectrum of requests. I will say one of the big fears, and I'm sure that some of our uh, our listeners to this program will have some of these same questions, is that people are worried, Dr. Kord, that they're going to be knocked out, unable to move, but they'll still be able to feel what's going on. First of all, is that possible? That Does that ever happen? How often does it happen if it does? It's a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it because we I, I do get that question a lot from patients, especially if they've watched that that horror movie called Awake, um, which I have not seen <laughs> myself for for good reason. I, I'm not really interested in watching that. Thanks very much. I don't but think you ahead. should. It's it, this is not a recommendation. This is an anti recommendation. Okay. <laughs> um, the chances of of being awake during anesthesia or having awareness under anesthesia are exceedingly low. There's a lot of fear because of 
movies and, and media, but in reality, awareness under anesthesia occurs in less than 0.1 to 0.2% of cases. So it'd probably be more dangerous to walk across the street. Um, the, the surgical procedure can be associated with lighter anesthesia depth. So for example, trauma surgeries or emergency surgeries or cardiac surgery with bypass might contribute to that 0.1 to 0.2% number, but it's still, again, exceedingly rare. Um, there's a lot of monitoring that anesthesiologists do in this day and age uh, to ensure that somebody is not awake, not forming memories, and not feeling pain, which are really critical components of anesthesia for, for surgical care. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sen, I, I, I guess I'll tell a personal story here. I'm one of those anesthesia phobic people because I've had a couple rough experiences over my life. I, mean, I remember one time I, I came out of surgery, a fairly simple surgery for a hernia. I felt drugged for days. It was terrible. I was throwing up forever. And then there was another one where I, I woke up and I was thrashing side to side. There were orderlies and nurses holding me down. Um, I, I have to say, I, maybe it's just me or, or maybe there is something about those particular procedures in the cocktail of medications I got. What do you think causes that? Yeah, and sorry, John, to hear about those experiences. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it just really speaks to uh, the variability uh, between people in terms of, um, you know, how their, their bodies receive the anesthesia medications um, and also uh, really how anxious you are before you um, receive general anesthesia. So, you know, for instance, what we observe is that, um, you know, patients who are uh, younger, healthier, and extremely anxious before they are put under um, can wake up quite anxious as well. So I wonder if that partially explains the second circumstance because you had a bad experience the first time around. Um, you know, uh, and speaking to uh, how the body handles side effects of medications, you know, some people are more prone to being nauseous afterwards. Um, and, you know, there are no side effects to anesthetic medications and nausea is a well-known side effect. And also things like, you know, getting confused afterwards and, um, and, and uh, feeling very groggy afterwards. It's dose dependent, but it's also also uh, person and genetics dependent as well. We'll get to a few of your questions uh, for our panelists in just a moment. Um, Dr. Sen, I, I do want to ask, though, that there's so much we still don't know about this work. We, we understand essentially how it works and how to get people into these various states. We don't really understand how anesthesia works, though, on a molecular level. Maybe you can walk us through what we do know and what we really don't know yet. Sure. So, you know, earlier um, I made the remark that anesthesia is all about pharmacology, and I think much of our work is uh, based on pharmacology as well as human physiology. And so, you know, we do know a lot, fortunately. And I think, you know, when we started out giving anesthetics uh, many, many, many decades ago, we didn't know a lot. We just knew that, you know, when you uh, when you pour a volatile anesthetic over a piece of cloth and put it over a patient's face, they will fall asleep. But exactly how much is too much? Well, that's where you have someone with a finger on the pulse on someone's forehead to monitor. And because we didn't know very much back then, and because we didn't have the basic monitoring equipment, we unfortunately had a lot of morbidity, or even we lost some patients that way. But we do what we do know today is, you know, we know molecular structure of the inhaled gases we give, or, you know, of all the basically all of the medications that we administer uh, down to the molecular detail. You know, we know the pharmacokinetics. So meaning, you know, we know how fast it onsets, how, how long it takes to peak and how long it goes it takes to go away. Uh, we know a lot about human physiology. So, you know, we know the receptors and how they interact uh, with medications and, and in disease state, um, you know, how inflammation and, and uh, think diseases like heart failure or other chronic diseases uh, impact, um, you know, the body's release inflammatory factors and also um, 
and, and how different disease state would respond to different inotropic or, or you know, a blood pressure and heart supporting medications. So we do know a lot. Um, you know, of course, there are always more for us to know. Uh, there are things we don't know that we don't know, but there are also things uh, that uh, we're act actively uh, exploring through research. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with anesthesiologist Dr. Ganesha Kaur and Dr. Louise Sun about how anesthesia works. And now we're going to take a few of your questions. Suzanne is with us, and Suzanne has a question about people's age in relation to anesthesia. Suzanne, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for taking this question. My mother-in-law is about to have surgery. She's 90 years old and very concerned about going under anesthetic. She's worried about her brain. She's worried about waking up. Uh, she's worried about all kinds of things. So the question is, is, do risks and side effects increase as people age? Thank you. It's a great question, Suzanne. Dr. Kaur, would you like to take that first? Sure. Um, I think, it, thank you for the question and, and I hope that she, she does well. Um, we provide anesthesia safely to people of all ages, um, people who have many comorbidities who might have heart disease or kidney disease. Um, we, we can do that safely. And I think talking through those pre-existing conditions with your anesthesiologist is going to be a critical component of providing safe anesthesia. One of the things that we know about anesthesia is that the doses necessary to provide surgical anesthesia change with patient-specific conditions. So by somebody's age, by somebody's weight, for example, I can't tell you the perfect dose of anesthesia or various anesthetics for, for her procedure, um, but these are things that the anesthesiologist should be doing, giving certain doses of medications based on her weight, um, changing the amount of inhaled anesthetic that we're giving, adjusting for age. We know that by each decade of life, anesthetic requirements change. And so that's something that, that is well known in anesthesiology that we can actually um, shift as we care for her. Suzanne, thanks so much for that question and best of luck to you. I really appreciate you asking it. Uh, Terry has a question for us about our brain's long-term reactions to anesthesia. Go ahead, Terry, you're on the show. Hi there, thanks for doing this. Um, I'm just curious because some of us have had brain injuries and concussions. And then when we have surgery, I'm actually kind of worried about my brain. I had a shoulder replacement in October. And then three months later, I had to have a knee arthroscopic surgery. And um, the only other surgery I've had was 43 years ago, an emergency cesarean. So uh, my brain handled the, the shoulder replacement fairly well. You know, it was kind of mushy and stuff, but it kind of recovered. But boy, after the second one, my brain is just mush and they have to redo the knee. And I'm just terrified. So how does that kind of impact work with the anesthesiology? That's a great question, Terry, and um, I, I'm glad we got some experts here to, to help you through that. Uh, Dr. Sun, why don't you uh, try to help Terry through that? Of course, and thanks for the question, Terry, and I really hope your uh, second knee surgery goes well. Um, you know, of course, previous uh, traumatic brain injury is a good consideration for um, uh, in terms of our administration of anesthetic medications and also in terms of the hemodynamic or blood pressure goals that we want to maintain uh, during surgery. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we really want to be cognizant of is, you know, keep the brain happy and well perfused, uh, make sure that the brain gets enough blood supply, enough food and enough perfusion pressure uh, during the procedure. And also, you know, sometimes uh, in avoidance of, uh, being very heavy handed with certain classes of sedation medications uh, that may uh, make people a little more prone to uh, being confused uh, or delirious during the perioperative period. And so, you know, of course, all of those have to be balanced out with the need to provide you with the best um, painkiller regimen that we can uh, for that type of surgery, because it is a procedure where we don't want you to be in pain afterwards, which means, um, you know, doctors are probably more likely to employ what they call multimodal uh, uh, pain management uh, type, type of regimen. Real quick, Dr. Sun, when you say profusion pressure, what do you mean? 
Perfusion pressure um, is basically, uh, you know, the ideal, basically the blood pressure that your end organ is seeing. Um, and, and so, you know, it's not a function of absolute blood pressure because it basically, you know, it, it's uh, if you're talking about perfusion pressure in the brain, then you're worried about venous back pressure. So other, in other words, you know, your, your CVP or your central venous pressure was sort of coming between your mean arterial pressure and that perfusion pressure. So, so there, there's a sort of like a middle gradient that you need to subtract the blood pressure reading you see on the screen from uh, mm -hmm. to calculate that number. Now, we've been getting this question from a few folks who submitted uh, before this event, and they're all asking, why does it seem like no time has passed after waking up from anesthesia? Dr. Kaur? It's a great question. Um, under, so while we don't know the exact, like we talked about earlier, molecular mechanism specifically of, of general anesthetics, we do know in some ways how this anesthesia works. And we know a lot about how memory formation is disrupted um, under general anesthesia. Um, the, the, the communication essentially between nerves at the synapse is disrupted. So you're just not forming memories. You're not processing time. You're not remembering things in the same way as you're awake when you're awake or, or when you're sleeping, like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. right? So it's just a, a um, a difference in how your brain is communicating because of the effect of the anesthetic. So you can wake up and feel as though no time has passed. I think also just looking back at one of the earlier questions about anesthetic awareness, because of the effects of the medications and the fact that it is not a pill, an anesthesia is not a pill that's taken or a machine, you know, that's turned on and off there's sort of a, um, a period of time, it takes a few minutes to go under anesthesia. If you're under general anesthesia and if it's sedation, you may be in and out of that anesthesia. So I think both memory formation and the processing of time can be confusing to a person. It might not be what it seems. So if somebody says I was aware under anesthesia, one of the first questions I'd have is, was it general anesthesia or was it sedation? With sedation, particularly light sedation, we would expect that you're, you might be hearing things. You're, you're not completely asleep. And so time and, and memory formation are shifted. Interesting. Uh, we have a question here from Jerry, uh, who wants to ask about meeting with your anesthesiologist. This is a, a big question, I think, for a lot of people. Jerry, go ahead. You're on the show. Um, normally for major surgeries, the anesthesiologist visits with the patient, introduces themselves, talks with the patient. How does the patient evaluate the anesthesiologist when they visit? Boy, that's a really, that's a really good question. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before, before our program there. I don't know which one of you, Dr. Kaur or Dr. Son would like to tackle that. Cause I think Jerry's speaking for a lot of people here. <laughs> well, how do you evaluate any of your physicians? Right. I mean, it's a, it's a really, there's, there's not a great, you know, when you, it's interesting, my, my um, family and I talk about this, when you buy a car, you might spend hours and hours looking at various aspects of that car. When you buy a house, you do the same thing. When you go to a doctor, you don't necessarily have, you know, a, a database that you can query to figure out who is a, who's a good doctor and who's not, not a great doctor. Um, I think it's always great to ask people that work with a physician um, how, how they are. So if I'm recommending a surgeon, I'll tend to talk to anesthesiologists. If I'm recommending anesthesiologists, I'll talk to my surgical colleagues. And I think that's, that's a great way to figure out if you're going to be comfortable with somebody. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Dr. Sun? Sure. I mean, I would say that another thing that I would keep in mind is that, uh, you know, if you go to the pre-op evaluation clinic, the anesthesiologist that you see is not necessarily the anesthesiologist who's going to be um, there for your surgical procedure. And so, you, you know, usually uh, anesthesiologists will work as a group um, and, and uh, it, it really just 
depends on who's assigned in the clinic that day, and it depends on the date of surgery, who is on the surgical schedule uh, and scheduled to work in the operating room that day. So um, at the time of the pre-op eval, they may not necessarily know who your assigned anesthesiologist is on the day of surgery. Gotcha. We, I think we've got time for one more question here from Frank. Uh, we'd like to ask about different forms of anesthesia. Go ahead, Frank, with your question. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking my question. I, I think you've answered it partially. Um, I was not familiar with the terms anesthesia as different uh, as being different from uh, sedation. Uh, I was concerned about how does general anesthesia differ uh, from uh, the lighter forms, such as uh, when I had my cataract surgeries. Um, Dr. Sun? Sure. So, I mean, there are uh, different degrees of anesthesia. Yeah, so anesthesia ranges from what we call monitored anesthetic care, which means, you know, we either perform the procedure with some freezing medication with or without um, some degree of sedation. Um, but we're, we're really mainly there to provide um, monitoring and uh, also physiologic support if needed uh, to relatively deep sedation, something called we called uh, conscious sedation. So, you know, you, you may be mildly aware of your surroundings, but you're more or less in the zone with, with the amount of medications we give you to general anesthesia where we completely take control of your uh, your body's physiology. So meaning, you know, we take over your breathing and, you know, we will manage uh, your, uh, your your heart rate, your blood pressure, and and so on, make sure that your uh, your organs are well perfused. Dr. Kaur, obviously, we wouldn't be able to do most surgeries if we didn't have anesthesia. How does the advancement of surgical techniques also necessitate the need to change how anesthesia is administered? Is it is it moving as fast as uh, surgery itself is in terms of, of how we're doing it? It's a great question. I think anesthesia moves hand in hand with surgery and the evolution of surgery. As different techniques are developed for surgical procedures, we have to evolve the anesthesia jointly with that. So for example, if we're moving to doing stents or, or balloon angioplasty for patients with coronary disease rather than open heart surgery, the anesthesia will evolve and, and shift um, and, and you'd be providing something different as surgical techniques are evolving, for example, with the introduction of um, robotic anesthesia, I'm mean, sorry, surgery, your anesthesia will evolve with that. Um, so I think there are some exciting advances in anesthesia that are coming alongside surgery, but then there are also some really interesting advances in anesthesia as a field um, on its own. And I should just ask you, Dr. Corman, a lot of the work that you do is in global health. And I, I'm wondering if this conversation is in any way different in terms of how anesthesia works, how it is part of the, the medical or surgical system, if you go to other places around the globe. Thanks so much for that question. I mean, I think my, my area of expertise really is in global health and, and anesthesia is different in different parts of the world, but it's also really different. There's a lot of, of disparity depending on where you are in the US. And so, um, you know, types of anesthesia differ. For example, local anesthetic is, is more common because it's cheaper or safer in different parts of the world the type of advanced anesthetic techniques we use or the medications we use vary by, you know, by cost. And so they're different in different parts of the world. Um, and just even simply the access to safe surgery and anesthesia mm -hmm. is very different in different parts of the world. Um, even within the United States, uh, you know, there's, there are huge disparities. I think one of the things that, that I had um, talked about, um, pulse oximeters, for example, we know that the ability to measure a patient's blood oxygen level by a pulse oximeter varies by how dark your skin is. So darker skin tones, it might be a pulse oximeter may be less accurate. And so that's what I, when I'm talking about advances in anesthesia, this is something that we need to fix. That needs to change. We have to have reliable monitors across the spectrum 
and and this is an area that I think is is open for development. Before we finish up, I, I should say that we're going to put up one more one question poll here in Zoom. Uh, you had a poll at the, at the beginning, and you should see this pop up right now. Uh, thanks for telling us just a little bit more about yourself. It really helps us as we do more of these events here at Science Friday. So thank you so much for, for weighing in on that poll. Dr. Sun, to close things out, we've talked about this a little bit, but there are going to be some people, some of the folks who, who ask questions, me for one, uh, who might be nervous about an upcoming surgery. So what should they make sure to discuss with their anesthesiologist beforehand? What can you tell them to sort of put their mind at ease about the process? Um, what I often tell our patients is that uh, we've done a few of those procedures here before, uh, which is a bit of a joke because we we uh, grossly <laughs> understate uh, the amount of expertise that is required uh, to uh, to do the job and to do it well. Um, what we also say to put the patient at ease is that uh, you, you know um, depending on their uh, medical condition, depending on their age, depending on complexity of surgery, we could offer some reassurances there, right? You're a relatively healthy and robust person. You're getting a pretty simple procedure versus, yeah, you're a complex person. It's complex procedure, but you're in the right center. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, those are, um, you know, some of the things that we discuss, of course, uh, patients are always entitled to ask about, you know, the degree of risk they're taking uh, in uh, pursuing surgery under certain anesthesia techniques. And I would say that for some procedures, it might be safer to do a sedation rather than a general anesthesia or a nerve block rather than a general anesthesia. Or some, there are some cases where general anesthesia might actually be safer than uh, the other modalities of anesthesia. So I think, you know, it, patients should um, always be open to talking about uh, the risks and benefits of different anesthesia procedures um, and, and also just really coming with an open mind. Um, I would say I, I let patients have a free shot at asking me anything. And so, you know, I, over the years, I've uh, I've received many uh, different types of questions, and I've always been very happy to address them. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much for addressing all these questions from us. Dr. Louise Sun is a professor of anesthesiology, uh, perioperative and pain medicine at Stanford University Health, based in Stanford, California. Dr. Ganesha Kaur is an anesthesiologist and director of the Human Rights Impact Lab and medical director of Weill Cornell Center for Human Rights at Weill Cornell Medicine. She's based in New York, New York. I'd like to thank you both so much for doing this. Thanks for answering all these questions. I feel like I know a lot more than I did before. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. And thanks so much to SciFry's Shoshana Buxbaum and Diana Plasker for producing this segment. I'm John Dankosky. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>